all right everyone good morning welcome back i am uh getting better and better by the day um i think next time i'll show a little screen with my face and hopefully by then i'll have a beautiful haircut too <coughs> excuse me okay um so today i'm going to get into chapter three in the textbook i do want to talk about uh the righteous mind a little bit and also just kind of you know kind of go over where we're at in in terms of the class and stuff so um it looks like everyone's getting the hang of pack back um got a few emails to answer i think a couple of people have questions um so remember by tonight you're you're posting about i believe it's the second chapter of the righteous mind and just to kind of one of the ways I, I would suggest reading that is if you notice at the at the end of every chapter he has a great summary sometimes when it comes to scientific reading especially scientific papers more than books like this but generally i actually read the conclusion first uh you know kind of want to know what their findings are where it's going uh and so on so anyway he's a good kind of summary at the end um and then he kind of goes through this kind of history of moral psychology and uh the differences between what it, what was going on in philosophy in psychology as well as uh primatology the study of uh, primates okay so and he kind of looks at different kind of three different figures that are important from West, <clears throat> western history uh plato going back to the ancient greeks who said that you know reason you know our ability to uh make rational judgments and so on that is what leads our thought that's kind of you know first and foremost then here you have thomas jefferson you know giving his uh, famous ted talk it looks like um he said you know it's actually a combination of reason and intuition slash emotion and i think he said you know heart and brain that sort of thing but basically referring to this sort of reason versus intuition and emotion uh gap or dichotomy and then david hume a philosopher uh in Scotland at around roughly around the same time as the revolution the, the American Revolution and so on he says no actually reason is led by intuition and emotion that it's emotion and intuition that come first uh, and then reason follows and then what hate or hate I'm sorry I hate uh, argues in his book is basically that Hume's right that when we actually look at you know he, and he goes through a lot of experiments and we'll go through a lot of this throughout this course um it often is our intuitions and our emotions that that uh that make the decision first before we're our calculating mind um but even that's a bit more complicated because you know how we uh respond emotionally or you know intuition is based upon um our genetic makeup our our social upbringing and a whole whole range of factors so anyway um fascinating things to discuss there i think for uh, this this week's discussion um he also talks about how he was influenced by a few different books one famous one is descartes error talking about rene descartes a famous um french philosopher i think therefore i am who kind of uh, you know kind of revolutionized this rationalist ideology or um what hate would call this rationalist delusion um where basically you know we can think about things rationally and weigh things in our minds and so on and so forth and uh antonio antonio damasio a a neuroscientist um sorry i've got a cat who's trying to escape the room and we'll try to get back in once i close the door anyway <laughs> she might make a guest appearance uh, later on uh, later on this semester okay anyway Damasio he writes this book called Descartes error kind of talking about you know humans are led by all sorts of emotions and um irrational uh irrational thoughts and so on um again David Hume was very very much ahead of his time in terms of thinking about how humans think and you know recognizing the importance uh, of emotion and so in the modules for this chapter i'll you know I'll throw in a, a few um short little videos if you want to watch them on on some of these people another thing that hate discusses in his book is that you know as he's thinking about 
you know, moral philosophy, to reading David Hume and, you know, Jefferson and Plato and so on. Um, but then he also reads Harold, Harold, uh, Howard Margulis's Patterns, Thinking, and Cognition. And this is basically, you know, kind of arguing that, you know, basically everything is kind of cognition, um, that emotions themselves are a type of information processing. That's usually what we think of uh, when we talk about cognition. We'll talk about that a lot more uh, next chapter. But basically two different kinds of cognition. You've got intuition, that sort of emotional gut feeling sort of thing, and then the conscious reasoning. And we'll, um, you know, we'll be talking about this, as I said, quite a bit. Quite a bit in the weeks to come. So anyway, Haight reads this, and so he's thinking about moral philosophy and you know, how moral philosophers for centuries had kind of just ignored or, you know, weren't aware of um just of, of, of how our minds work. And so, you know, he's bringing in uh, psychology and the social sciences. Okay, so kind of moving on to chapter three of the textbook, the social intro, the social, social psychology textbook, um, which is a chapter on the social self, the selfies you delete, the, those are the real you, um, you know, the best pictures, uh, you know. Anyway, well, we'll get there. Okay. So kind of going back to the study of psychology and here, you know, we're, this is going to be a fascinating lecture because we, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, cultural differences in terms of psychology and how these things play out. So one of the founders of modern psychology, William James, brother of the writer Henry James, 1890, he writes the book, The Principles of Psychology. Um, he terms this, this or he coins this term called the social me, um, basically referring to those parts of yourself that come out of your um, your social ties to other people, your connections, your relationships. Um, you know, if you're a, a girlfriend or a you know soccer player or a musician or whatever it might be, one of these things that are sort of social in nature. Um, you know, and psychologists have sort of always known that, you know, we're sort of shaped by people we have interactions with. <clears throat> and I'll talk much more about the Greeks in a second. But just suffice it to say that, you know, a lot of Western culture comes out of some of this, some of these questions that, that uh, the ancient Greeks brought up, brought up, or at least recorded, uh, talking about knowing them themselves and, you know, what does it really mean uh, to know yourself, you know, talking about introspection and, and things like this. Um, so introspection is, you know, in some ways you know more about yourself than anyone and than anyone else. At the same time, it's as we'll see, it's very biased. Um, you know, it can lead to misperceptions about ourselves or about our own actions, um, as well as about other people and and their actions and how other people see see us. Kind of going back to the theory of mind. So, um, many of you, I am guessing, have probably heard of and probably have taken the Myers-Briggs personality test. This divides people into introverts and extroverts, and there are 16 different personality types. I, for about 20 years or something, I've been an INFP. Um, now the, 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 the Myers-Briggs test is coming under a lot of criticism. Um, and this book came out about a year or two ago, looking at the history of the Myers-Briggs test, and it was actually developed by a a mother and her daughter, um, and they were reading the work of the psychologist Carl Jung, and he had sort of identified these, I think there were four different personality types he, he kind of identified, and they uh, sort of developed these tests to examine them. Now, I haven't read this book, so, you know, I can't really comment too much on it, although I, <laughs> in one of these days when I have more time, um, I would really love to read this because I always found the Myers-Briggs test to be I thought it fairly accurately described me, um, and since I consistently re received the same result, um, you know, I thought it was uh, quite reliable, but perhaps not. 
We'll talk about later the, the big five personality test, which is the main sort of go-to now, uh, seems to be the most accurate in terms of also uh, from a neuroscience perspective. Anyway, um, other things about ourselves. So we we talked about schemas last time, um, and we we actually develop self schemas to basically you know <clears throat> um, develop thoughts about ourselves. <clears throat> so there's a series of experiments that were done about 10, 12 years ago or so where the setup was um, these researchers asked people how accurate they think they are at assessing how much they perform certain activities. So, you know, how much they read or play sports or something like that. Uh, they were then asked how well they thought other people were at accurately assessing someone else's behavior. Okay. So then everyone thought that they would be more accurate in assessing their own behavior. Um, you know, we're all, we all tend to think of ourselves as experts about ourselves and so on. And so then they, the researchers did a follow up where over the next four days they had informants, uh, people who were close loved ones of the participants in the study. They were roommates, uh, family members, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and they had them assess the participants' behavior. So the participants, in addition to being monitored by loved ones, they also wore um, a device that actually measured the frequency of their behavior. And it found that the report of those uh, close to us, such as our family, are about as accurate as our own uh, in anticipating our own behavior. So um, the people, you know, if you live with a family member or, uh, you know, maybe some of you will go on and couple with someone and you'll be with them for several years and so on, you know, basically after a while, they'll be able to, you know, kind of, in, you know, predict your behavior just as well as you. Uh, in some ways, they'll do better. And in some ways, uh, they'll do worse. Sort of interesting kind of um, thing. Another thing that the researcher Hazel Marcus, who's done a lot of research in this area, there's kind of a classic study that she she did. She looked at self schemas, so things that we believe about ourselves. So, um, you know, say I'm I think I'm good at sociology or something like that. So my self schema is that I'm just you know a badass sociologist. And so she says that okay, if we have these self schemas that exist, then a person who has a self schema in a particular domain should be able to process domain information in that domain more quickly and more readily um, reject information that contradicts the schema. Okay, so she set up a test to do this. She had... That's my cat sneezing. <laughs> so anyway, gesundheit, Willow. Um, so anyway, she identified participants who labeled themselves as either quite dependent, uh, dependent on other people, dependent on, uh, on others and so on, or independent, you know, self-sufficient and so on. And then those who are at the extremes, those who are, you know, very dependent or very independent, uh, she labeled schematic, um, meaning, you know, they, they had a strong sense of, of who they were. And then she called people who were sort of, you know, kind of in the middle, somewhat independent, somewhat dependent as a schematic. Okay, so... Um, and then several weeks later, she had them come back and rate how well uh, a series of traits presented on a computer screen described them. And she found that the schematic ones who, you know, in my case, say I'm really good at sociology or think I am or whatever. So that's my self schema. So um, if I was in there, this, I would have judged schema relevant traits as true um, or not true of themselves much more quickly than a schematic participants um, who have to, you know, map information about themselves. So if I see something about, um, you know, sociology is a, uh, you know, is a good way in which to understand the world and, you know, I'll agree with that and, you know, much more quickly than um, an a schematic person who may think about it and, you know, maybe they think, well, actually, I think psychology is or uh, something else. Anyway, um, your book goes into maybe a clear definition or, or explanation than I did. Okay. <clears throat> 
So where does our sense of self come from? This is kind of an age-old philosophy question, religious question. Well, the social psychologists, we say, oh, well, you know, obviously we're interested in, you know, uh, nature and genetics and everything like that. But at the end of the day, as social psychologists, we're interested in the aspects of the self that are developed by um, our, our social situations. So, um, you know, there's the famous uh, picture from Greek mythology. Narcissus uh, looks into the mirror and is captivated by, by, his, by his image. Um, that's where narcissism comes from and something, again, we'll talk about in more detail. There's a lot of things that actually make us who we are in terms of our, our social selves and how we act uh, in society. Um, you may or may not have heard of what's called the birth order effect. Uh, this is this is one of those questions I love asking in classes where we talk about meritocracy, the idea that, you know, where you end up in society is based upon, you know, your level of effort, how much work you put into it, and so on and so forth. It's kind of a, you know, kind of a guiding ideal of the United States and, you know, a lot of Western capitalist uh, societies. Lula, come here. I'm trying to get my cat to <laughs> stop her scratching. Okay, so one of the things that we find... One second. Okay, one of the things we find, though, is that consistently, not every case, obviously, but we're talking in generalities. Um, older siblings are often found to be more ambitious. Uh, they, you know, will will you know, tend to go to the higher school, uh, you know, the higher ranked school. Um, sometimes they're more responsible, that sort of thing. Younger siblings are more rebellious and open to uh, open to rebellion and that sort of thing. Um, really kind of, kind of fascinating, uh, we'll talk about this in more, more detail later, but again, it's one of those things where, you know, we have a society where the ideal is that you work hard, you know, where you end up in society is based on where, uh, you know, how hard you work and how much effort you put into it. Um, biologically, though, it kind of turns out that, you know, uh, where you are in terms of your the sibling order may may play a greater role. And so that begs the question then, well, we've got to actually sort of developed a society that turns out to be very <laughs> biased toward older siblings. So anyway, I'm fascinated with that to, to no end. Um, okay, and well, I guess it might return to that at some point again, too. Other things. So, you know, big, you know, major, obviously, the main thing that we're doing in social psychology is trying to figure out uh, the context, um, you know, trying not to make that fundamental attribution error. Um, I'm going to kind of move slowly because I want to get to some fascinating things. Okay, so... Um, sociologist who kind of looked at some of these kind of more psychological things, a guy named Irving Goffman, he used the the analogy of sort of a of a theater, basically, um, that, you know, we kind of put on an act and we're often, you know, kind of like actors often in, in plays, especially, you know, we go back and we change into costume. We have like three or four different roles, you know, throughout the play, that sort of thing. And so we're all often a lot of our a lot of what we're doing is trying to attempt to control how other people view us. Um, a lot of interesting facial stuff, and we'll get into that in more detail. Uh, excuse me, in in uh, in more detail later on. So here's where you know the kind of fascinating stuff of today's lecture, at least. I, the stuff I find really fascinating. So we're going to talk about sort of more individualistic societies and civilizations and more interdependent or collectivist. And, you know, this has a lot of relevance for uh, today and, you know, considering um, coronavirus, the economy, political systems, and so on and so forth. So, you know, individualism 
comes, we'll talk about individualism more in a, you know, kind of its origins in a moment, but uh, basically, you know, the United States sort of embodies, you know, the closest thing to a libertarian society where individual rights are, are basically paramount. Um, you know, great book about that, you know, Individualism Old and New by the philosopher John Dewey. Um, yet at the same time, biologically, we're pretty similar. And so one of the things that's, that's so interesting is how do these, you know, different social systems then uh, develop? Um, and then how they affect us, how do they affect our social organization and our, our biological makeup. So this is looking at degree of individualism. So again, the high levels in the United States, Canada, um, fairly high, you know, the Anglo, um, English, England and the United States have a lot, of, a lot in common in terms of that. Same with Australia, again, sort of the Anglo uh, world. France, Germany, other countries, Scandinavia, still, again, high levels of individualism, uh, maybe a little bit more collectivism in, in some of the continental parts of Europe, less individualism in, uh, in South America. Then you've got a lot of countries that, you know, were not really surveyed for this, but what you would find is probably more like India and Japan, um, or even lower than that, uh, kind of like you would you would see in, in in Mexico, for example. So a lot of Asian countries and a lot of African countries, um, kind of like kind of like you see here in the, 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 the Philippines, um, where you have low levels of individualism, and you can read about this specific chart in in the textbook. So collectivism then um, is more common in non-Western cultures, East Asia in particular. You see it in China, Japan, Korea, South Asia, India, Malaysia, and so on. And the big difference then is, you know, individualism is the focus is inward on yourself, on, on the individual self. Collectivism is the self in relation to others, in relation to uh, other people. The philosopher who she says uh, in the Confucian centered in the Confucian human centered philosophy, man cannot exist alone. All action must be in the form of interaction between man and man. Uh, so basically, trying in contrast to the individualism that we see develop um, in the West, we see something different develop um, in what we call interdependent or collectivist cultures. Um, increasingly, I think we use the, we like to use interdependent. It's a bit more act, accurate. Collectivist also has sort of connotations with, you know, Soviet, <laughs> the Soviet Union and uh, communist China, whereas interdependent, you know, predates, you know, those types of organization and you see it in other, uh, other cultures around the world. So, why why these differences? Why is it that we see more collectivism uh, in East Asia, for example? A lot of it has to do with geography and uh, the development of our relationship with land, with the land, with water, with nature, essentially. So, basically, rice is a big part of it. So, rice and their irrigation systems require huge amounts of collective labor. And so that's really the underlying reason why East Asian cultures are much more collectivist, much more interdependent, because rice uh, farming just requires a lot more uh, teamwork, a lot more you know cooperation and stuff like that. Oops. Um, <clears throat> so really kind of fascinating. Just to give you some idea, the uh, and I may be pronouncing this wrong. Du Juangyan irrigation system, which is about 2,000 years old. So, you know, going back to basically, you know, when the Roman Empire was was still around in the West, uh, it actually irrigates more than 5,000 kilometers of rice farms uh, near Chengdu in China currently. So that's really kind of kind of incredible. So other things that are kind of interesting here that are, that are, that are actually quite fascinating. So we, so rice is a big part of it. Um, how do we know that? So the study came out, it was published in Science in 2014. 
And it looked at parts of northern China where they actually grow wheat, uh, not rice. And it turns out wheat is a much more individualistic sort of crop. It does, you know, you don't doesn't take quite the same amount of teamwork and cooperation. You can work more individually. So a study kind of looked at things there, and what they found is that um, in certain sort of experiments, they performed closer to Europeans and Westerners, Americans, than uh, people in other parts of China, where they were had, where they had were um, dependent upon a rice economy. So other things they found in this area of China that grew wheat, though it was more individualistic, they found higher rates of divorce. Again, we see higher rates of divorce in places that are more individualistic. They also saw more inventiveness, uh, more, more patent filings, you know, filings for a new invention. Um, you know, kind of symbolizing uh, entrepreneurialism, things that you see in more individualistic societies. So really fascinating uh, kind of history there. Well, it doesn't, the fascinating history does not end there. Now, I'm not going to go into this in great detail. <clears throat> But basically, dopamine, uh, you know, kind of rewards you, as you know. You got the, the dopamine um, receptors here, and they do different things. And, um, you know, it makes you feel good if you have a normal binding of the dopamine. And then you transmit the dopamine to different receptors and so on and so forth. Um, and you need more dopamine uh, to feel good. Okay, so what does that have to do with any of this? So what we find uh, is the DRD4 is a hormone receptor. Receptor. The 4R is the most variant. It's found in basically half of East Asians and half of Europeans and European Americans. The 7R variant is a bit more rare. Um, we find it in 23% of Europeans and European Americans, basically white uh, people, but only in 1% of East Asians. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. What's going on there? Um, well, the, when, what, what is the 7R variant? Well, we see that the uh, 7R variant is associated with higher incidence, incidences of risk-taking behavior, um, impulsive behavior, promiscuity, that's as you see here, <laughs> and this is about promiscuity, um, but also novelty, you know, entrepreneurial things, that sort of thing. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Um, so where do we see perhaps people with the highest incidence of the 7R uh, variants? Actually, they are people in the Amazon. There are tribes in the Amazon where they can range from roughly 40% um, of the 40% to 40 to 70 percent, um, which is really kind of astonishing. So why is it? What's going on here? And it has to do with migration and, you know, people who uh, migrated into the Amazon for whatever reason uh, retained this, this 7R. So why I'm bringing it up here, though, and, you know, as I said, there's this interesting difference between the West, uh, Westerners and East Asianers. Um, so basically, when you had a rice-based economy, you didn't want people going off doing their own thing or else the system would collapse and everyone would die from famine. <laughs> um, so, you know, you didn't want, you wanted people to be more cooperative and, you know, maybe not be so impulsive and stuff like that. Um, so basically, the theory right now is that in East Asian populations, where you had survival based on collective work, like like rice farming, over the generations, over the centuries and millennia, um, it, their social structure is basically selected against the 7R variant. So really fascinating. So again, it's, you know, the, the relationship, and we'll see this over and over again, between nature and nurture goes and twists around in different ways, and there's interesting feedback loops and so on and so forth. Um, here's a here's a, a chart looking at it, so looking at different groups of people, different sort of ethnic groups and tribes and so on, and um, the, 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 what am I talking about, 7R, D4 genes and so on, and so here you find high rates of these 
groups that are located primarily in the Amazon, uh, South America, and then you see like, you know, nothing or, you know, little 1% or whatever among uh, the Chinese, different groups of the Chinese, the Japanese, Cambodians, and so on and so forth. Again, like I said, just really, really kind of fascinating there. Okay. Um, so kind of continuing on and then I'll actually return to, to some of the interesting experiments we see. So individualism, you know, this kind of comes out of the Western culture. Um, you know, probably one of the best classic books on this is On Liberty by John Stuart Mill. Um, John Stuart Mill, of course, was also influenced very much by Harriet Taylor Mill, his, his wife. Um, you know, just the sexism of the time didn't allow her to get the uh, the appreciation she probably should have received. She was very influential in his book uh, that he wrote on women's rights, on you know, women needing the right to, to vote and so on. Anyway, individualism, we find it in the United States, Canada, Australia, um, the idea that, you know, individual rights are, are paramount, that this is kind of the, the key. So here's just kind of a, you know, this is from your book, you know, you see the differences, uh, the comparisons between independent cultures and uh, interdependent cultures. Some, some interesting differences in terms of uh, some experiments that have been done. So some have looked at how, how the brains function, you know, between Americans, people born and raised in America, uh, and people born and raised in, say, uh, China or Japan or South Korea, where a lot of these comparison studies are done. And they find that subjects from individualistic cultures strongly activate the prefrontal cortex. Remember the, uh, you know, the part of your brain that's making moral judgments. Um, the part that's most shaped by socialization, least shaped by genes. So anyway, when subjects from individualistic cultures look at pictures of themselves compared to pictures of a friend, that strongly activates stuff going on in their prefrontal cortex. Um, when East Asian subjects look at a picture of themselves as opposed to a picture of a friend, there's much less activation going on. So, uh, you know... People in the West are just sort of mentally geared towards thinking more about uh, themselves. Um, so they're just, you know, that's part of their brain is just more active when they see a picture of themselves. Maybe they're, you know, making judgments about how bad that selfie was and so on and so forth. How much better their friend looks or something like that. Um, so another, another interesting experiment when asked in free recall, um, to remember times that they influence someone or you know that they that there was some influence going on between two people so they were asked americans and east asians were asked uh, you know some something about influence and so americans are more likely than east asians to remember times in which they influence someone else so you know I'll remember all the times that I influenced all those students to think, you know, sociologically and psychologically and so on and so forth. East Asians, when asked this, are more likely to remember times when someone influenced them. Uh, so if I was an East Asian, maybe I'd remember um, times back when I was a student being influenced by a professor and being taught about how important social psychology is and <laughs> that sort of thing. Okay, uh, the other thing, there's the mesolimbic dopamine system, so not won't get into this a whole lot right now, but basically, you know, your kind of reward system, that sort of thing. Um, in European Americans, it sort of activates uh, when people in America, European Americans, look at um, excited facial expressions. And I should say not just, you know, European Americans, Black Americans too. Um, like, don't want to get too confused here. We'll re return to this in more detail. But basically, when you see 
the mesolimbic dopamine system get activated in Chinese people, it's when they are looking at someone with a calm expression. Uh, so really kind of a fascinating difference there. So another example, if you show a person a or show a picture of a person standing in a complex scene, maybe there's a bunch of other people, you know, dogs and cats, you know, flying around or something, you know, complex stuff going on. East Asians will be more accurate at remembering, you know, the, the entire scene, whereas Westerners will remember that person who's, say, in the middle of the, in the middle of the picture. Um, now you can put on eye trackers and kind of, you know, measure, you know, measure where people are looking or actually, you know, you know look at where people are looking. I'll just leave it at that. Look at where people are looking. Okay, so in eye trackers then show that Westerners tend to focus on the center of the picture while East Asians actually will scan uh, the, the entire picture. If you force Westerners to focus more on the context and you for, force East, Asian, East uh, Asian, Asians to focus on the center, uh, then you, in, in both groups you get the frontal cortex working harder because, you know, you know, in Asia you've been kind of socialized to think about things more holistically. So if you have to focus on one individual thing, then you have, you have to, your brain works a little bit harder. Uh, conversely, if you're uh, born in France or the United States and you're kind of born to think, you're raised to think more individualistically, um, you know, to then think about the entire scene and all the context, you know, your brain has to work a little bit harder. Fascinating differences. So one of the authors of your textbook, uh, Richard Nisbet, has done, I think, some of the best research on this. Well, he's really kind of opened opened the doors to some of this stuff. Um, so he's got a lot of books, and you can see some of his talks online. So one study that they did fairly recently uh, with a graduate student named Hanna Chua, Chua. Um, they used a tracking device, again, monitoring eye movements of about 25 Americans, 25 Chinese participants, all graduate students in Michigan. Um, while the students stared for three seconds at pictures of objects against complex backgrounds. Uh, there was about 36 different images. They included, among many others, a train, a tiger uh, in a forest, and an airplane with mountains in the background. And what they found was, you know, just kind of looking at the eye tracker, they found that the Americans focused on the foreground object, say the tiger, um, about 118 milliseconds sooner um, on average than the Chinese participant did, and then continued to look at that object, the, the, the tiger, uh, for a longer period of time. The Chinese tended to move their eyes back and forth between the main object, so the tiger, and the background, um, and then looked at the background for longer than the Americans did. Now, is there a right or wrong way to do it? No, I don't think so. It's, it's just different ways of, you know, focusing on uh, what's in front of us, on reality and so on. Another fascinating study that they did, this is kind of a classic one, so they presented this, there's about a 20 second video um, of these vignettes of underwater scenes to both Japanese and American participants. So as you see there, you've got, you know, got some big fish here, you've got some seaweed, a little frog over here, a snail, a plant, and some fish and some bubbles and so on. Okay. So, um, after seeing the video twice, so, you know, 20 second video there, the participants were asked to report what they had seen. The first sentence was coded as to whether a participant initially mentioned one of the salient objects, meaning the, you know, big fish or the big seaweed, you know, things that are bigger, larger, that sort of thing. Um, or, uh, okay, so the, the, the sentence was coded whether they mentioned the salient objects or the field, you know, the watercolor, the floor of the scene, uh, you know, stuff going on in the background, that sort of thing. 
So what they found was, you know, probably know where this is going, but uh, American participants started their statements by mentioning salient objects like the big fish uh, f more frequently than the Japanese did. In contrast, Japanese participants began by mentioning information about the field uh, almost twice as often as Americans did. So overall, Japanese actually made 65% more observations about the field than Americans did. And Japanese participants mentioned almost twice as many uh, relations between objects uh, and the field as did American participants. So Americans are not as good at uh, grasping context. I don't have the numbers in front of me, I don't believe. Um, let's see in my notes if I can find, I forget what they were. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the Americans were much better than at uh, memorizing, you know, what the fish looked like in the foreground, you know, what kind of fish it was, how many gills or not gills, how many uh, fins it had, that sort of thing. Um, so any, again, interesting differences. So again, is this, you know, something that's just biological? Well, kind of like with the China example where you had collectivism in the rice growing parts, uh, more sort of individualism in the wheat growing parts. You can look at Japan too and see some, uh, see some differences in behavior. So Hokkaido, the kind of northern, uh, northernmost island of Japan, was settled in the mid 1800s uh, by a bunch of pioneering folk um, uh, that were kind of like the pioneers in in the United States. They had this same sort of frontier spirit, um, you know, trying to settle off on their own, that sort of thing. Um, and you started and you see then people have done studies now um, where they find that or actually they decide to do studies to see if you know are they are the residents of Hokkaido more similar to Americans and Westerners <coughs> to me than they might be uh, to other Japanese. So what they found was that Hokkaido residents were nearly as likely as Americans to commit the fundamental attribution error. So remember, uh, generally speaking, East Asianers are less likely uh, to make the fundamental attribution error. So Shinobu Katayama I hope I'm pronouncing that right. The co-chair of the University of Michigan's Culture and Cognition program uh, says that, you know, the frontier doesn't really exist anymore, um, but its myth and discourse are still, uh, are still very, very powerful. Okay, so kind of continuing on. Um, so again, these, these differences, you know, may wonder where where they spring from a lot of psychologists have you know and historians and philosophers and so on um you know often compare china and ancient greece and rome because you have in both cases um good record keeping these you know societies that were somewhat similar in some ways but but a lot different in other ways you know the Greeks and, and the Romans as well, they were sort of a seafaring people. They had these different city-states on islands and so on. Um, China was a much greater, larger landmass. Um, and for various reasons, part of it, the ecology of the area, you had um, more, as I said, more collectivist agriculture uh, happening. Whereas in, you know, in, in Greece, you had fishing and uh, you, you just had different, uh, you had a different ecology happening. You also had sort of differences in terms of understanding the role of government, the role of the state and so on. Yes, there's Confucianism and you have, you know, Socrates and, you know, even going, um, going there and everything. In, in China, there was a period called the Warring States era where you, like it said, like it sounds, you had a lot of different, uh, wars between different, different areas. A figure named Lord Shang, uh, Yang Shang, roughly around 390 
BCE, um, basically develops, he helps develop what's called legalism, the, the kind of main doctrine of government in China for uh, the next few hundred years. And he basically says, you know, the main aim is a rich state and a strong army. That's, you know, the greatest benefit to people is order. And so you need, um, you know, strong governments and people, you know, working the rice farms and so on. Um, not doing things impulsively with that 7R <laughs> variant and whatnot. Um, and so the state then must take advantage of these people's desires. And he said then that leaders receive this mandate from heaven, this powerful state. And he said humans are born having desires. When they have desires but do not get the objects of their desires, then they cannot but seek some means of satisfaction. Um, and he basically goes on to say if they can't get it, then they struggle. And if they struggle, then there will be chaos and if there's chaos, then there will be uh, impoverishment. So um, you see then that's, that's sort of the development of, uh, of China in you know, a lot of similar um, systems developed then in East Asia. In the West, by contrast, ancient Greece, Rome, and so on, as the libertarian uh, philosopher, libertarianism is kind of like, uh, you know, individualism taken to its political extreme as a political philosophy. Um, he says that basically the distinctive principle of Western social philosophy is individualism. So um, a lot of people then will date and will basically say that secular humanism and individualism uh, come from the ancient Greeks, uh, Plato and Aristotle and so on. And I will say that that I think is most partly true. I think that's part of this story, but sometimes what's left out of this story is the role that Christianity played. So while the Greeks were very contemplative about the self and, uh, you know, Narcissus and you know, introspection and so on. It's when you have the rise of Christianity um, that you really get, I think, the the the, the greater Western focus on individualism because all of a sudden now uh, the role of the individual is to is to you know attain salvation is to be you know follow uh follow the church uh follow the teachings of christ and god and so on um and it's up to the individual to you know carry this journey this picture comes from the the book pilgrim's progress where uh the character named christian carries all his sins burdened on his back um and goes on these adventures and so on and so I would argue, and others argue this, that um, that Christianity plays a huge role in making the individual paramount in Western civilization. Christianity is one of the first religions that asks people to leave their families. Uh, most religions and belief, belief systems have been tied to clans and families. Uh, Christianity was one of the first that says, you know, if your family isn't Christian, then you need to leave. Uh, you, know, you need to leave your family and join, uh, come join the congregation. So that's a huge break in, in terms of human thought. And that, and that kind of leads us uh, to, on this individual path. Um, and then you get sort of the, you know, non-Christian individualists, uh, famously Friedrich Nietzsche, so, you know, kind of makes the argument, again, making the argument that the individual individualism is, is paramount in Western society. So the individual has always had to struggle to keep from being overwhelmed by the tribe. If you try it, you will be lonely, often, and sometimes frightened, but no price is too high to pay for the privilege of owning yourself. Uh, and then the famous writer Oscar Wilde says art is the intense mode of individualism uh, that the world has known. However, if going back to the 1500s, some of you may know the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, it's not like 
people on the in the West were just you know saying oh just do whatever you want it's a it's a free for all um, no uh, Thomas Hobbes basically said that well our individualism is problematic and because we have uh, such strong individualism we actually need uh, a strong government and in this quote government is necessary not because man is naturally bad but because man is by nature more individualistic than social uh, that's the argument that Europeans were making at that time. Um, and so he says, hereby it is manifest that during the time that men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition called ware. Ware is basically anarchy, and such a ware as is of every man against every man. So basically you know, war, conflict, social anarchy, and so on. So then you can see from that perspective the attempts to rein in individualism uh, from fascism, for example. Benito Mussolini says, against individualism, the fascist conception is for the state. Lib liberalism denied the state in the interests of the particular individual. Fascism refer reaffirms the state as the true reality of the individual. So I'm trying to make the argument that, you know, the, the, the individual is the state and the state is the individual. That was the big argument of fascism. The famous libertarian writer Ayn Rand argued against that, and um, a lot of people will say that, you know, individualism or libertarianism uh, is 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 racism and she argues no actually racism is the lowest most crudely primitive form of collectivism because basically you're um you know you're looking at an out group and you know thinking they're inferior or something because of this collectivism and we'll talk about why our minds so often do things like that and have historically uh, other examples from Western culture, Henry Ford, individualism is what makes cooperation worth living, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting take on that. Uh, Albert Camus, a lot of people are reading his book, The Plague, right now. Um, about a pandemic. Uh, yes, yet there are still people who confuse individualism and selfishness. So he's trying, trying to make the point that, you know, you can be individualistic, but that doesn't mean you have to be, uh, you have to be selfish. And then there are some more pessimistic people like Eric Fromm, who watched uh, fascism and the rise of Soviet communism, and he saw this mass consumerist society, and he said, you know, we're not on the way to greater individualism, but we're becoming more manipulated. Uh, we're becoming a more manipulated mass civilization through, you know, media and so on and so forth. And he writes these books, The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness and The Escape from Freedom, that had a big influence on your professor when he was younger. Okay, so I think we'll stop there for today when we come back next. Oh, let me wait. Hold on one second. <laughs> um, so again, the, the East-West differences we've talked about um, in, in, in some detail, and we shall return to them in greater detail. Um, but one figure who I think is very interesting, who kind of walks that divide and walked it in a very interesting time period, was the writer Mishima Yukio, um, the new Japanese, or the Japanese pronounced ordering of, of, of names is reverting back to the traditional way. Um, he was a writer, he was probably bisexual, he wrote this book called Confessions of a Mask, wrote something like 35 books. Um, and he was really opposed to this new modern Japan that developed out of the Second World War, after the Second World War. And he was a traditionalist wanting to uh, go back to, you know, the samurai ethics. He said a samurai is a total human being, whereas a man who is completely absorbed in his technical skill has degenerated into a function, one cog in a machine. So Mishima does something that's kind of fascinating. Like I said, he kind of glorifies um, samurai culture. <clears throat> but he's also but he also reads a lot of Nietzsche and he lead, reads a lot of Western philosophy. And so he's very fascinated with individualism as well. So he's, there's this tension in his work that he writes about. And a lot of his work focuses on death, um, on suicide, uh, particularly seppuku, which was the, the samurai way of um, 
of killing oneself um, for dishonor or whatever it might be, you know, stabbing yourself in the in, in the stomach, you know, cutting out your entrails, and then someone else would chop off your head. So Mishima, he spent his life writing many books about individuals, about about people in and violence and beauty and beauty and brutality are his two main themes uh, that he identifies as being part of a Japanese culture. Um, but his whole life he saw as being sort of an act too. So he famously in 1970, I believe, uh, he he has this militia of his own. He's kind of this right-wing nationalist and he kind of takes over this military base or he takes over part of it or something and he gives this speech to the soldiers out below, down below, telling them to, you know, you know, stand up for the old ways of the imperial dynasty and family and so on. And they're jeering him and mocking him and, you know, telling him to, <laughs> and, you know, go back to writing books and stuff like that. Uh, and Mishima goes inside after he gives the speech and he commits seppuku. He slashes his stomach open. Um, then one of his his fellow his, his fellow militiaman uh tries to chop off his head fails at it and has his head chopped off by someone else um and then finally mishima's head is chopped off as well <laughs> i bring him up because again he sort of straddles that 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 very interesting divide between the east and west and especially at that time period uh in the in the, after the second world war so when we come back, we're going to talk about, you know, another thing Mishima talked about was honor and its culture of honor. And one of the things we'll talk about when uh, on Thursday's lecture um, will be this culture of honor There's, that's described a little bit in the textbook and also be talking about uh, politics and psychology in, in a bit more detail than we have uh, before. All right. Well, have a good afternoon, and I look forward to reading and engaging with you on Packback.